2. 11. I have been asked by a great Western Orientalist, who has also asked me not to name him, that as I should be dealing with dialogue between Christians and Muslims, he feels that it is incumbent upon me to denounce, as he puts it, the scorn which some Muslim scholars have from time to time directed towards European and American Orientalists and other specialists. He also writes that I should make it plain that, in his estimation, one cannot speak of, or for, Muslims as a whole, since they are grouped into two main sections, the Sunni and the Shia, and that therefore he believes there can be no dialogue between Muslims as such and Christians as such, and that Sufis, mystics of Islam, though surrendering to God, are in fact anti-Muslim. I beg your indulgence to deal with these points. Ordinarily one would not have given them much prominence, but after contacting a number of Christian scholars who have made Islam their study, I have discovered from their reactions that they too feel that this is a fit subject for emphasis. When the Prophet Muhammad was asked to curse unbelievers, he replied, according to authoritative tradition, I was not sent for this, nor was I sent but as a mercy to mankind. He further said, It is unworthy to injure people's reputations, and it is unworthy to curse anyone, and it is unworthy to abuse anyone, and it is unworthy for the faithful to talk vainly. As to the matter of whether we speak as Muslims, in spite of what has been called the difference between Shias and Sunnis, I do not myself believe that it is necessary to attempt to compose answers when this has already been sufficiently well done. The Muslims follow the precept laid down by Muhammad when he said, Muslims are like one wall, some parts strengthening others, in such a way they must support each other. Following the reasoning that something which has been well and adequately said should be repeated rather than an attempt made to supplant it, I am fortunate to be able to quote from a recent comment upon this subject by a great scholar of Islam in Persia, Syed Hussain Nassar, who is Professor of the History of Science and Philosophy in Tehran, and comes from an honoured family. In a book recently published in the West, he says, In fact, Sunnism and Shiism, belonging both to the total orthodoxy of Islam, do not in any way destroy its unity. The unity of a tradition is not destroyed by different applications of it, but by the destruction of its principles and forms as well as its continuity. Being the religion of unity, Islam in fact displays more homogeneity and less religious diversity than other worldwide religions. Nasser Sayyid Hussein, Ideals and Realities of Islam, London, George Allen and Unwin, 1966, 1971 Impression. Within the submission system of Islam, as in Christianity, there is room for a tremendous variety of opinion once the basic beliefs are accepted. The basis of Islam is submission to God, but there have been, indeed still are, Muslims who accept the Qur'an as the law and not the traditions, the sayings of the Prophet. There are even those who call the Sharia, commonly accepted as the holy way of law, or Islam in its extrapolation from the Qur'an, an innovation. The basic commandment is so basic that this diversity in unity is possible. Muslim thinkers themselves sometimes express surprise when they come across varieties of this phenomenon though they seldom fail to integrate examples into their thought when time has done its work. And this has always been the way in Islam. As for the misconception of Sufis as mad dervishes, opportunists and mountebanks, or mysterious at best, degenerate at worst, undermining Islam, faith and social stability, cultists of doubtful habits and exploiting tendencies, imitators of saints, this is by no means confined to the West. But since the explanation is simple, that there are rotten apples possible in any barrel, 
and Sufi's utterances are not always understood without context. And plenty of people have helped to write the record down the centuries. What is needed is only information on a wide scale and understanding, and only those lacking one or more of these really remain opposed. The outlook for Sufi knowledge and appreciation of the past, present and future Sufi contribution is bright indeed. Professor Nasser has illuminated many important aspects of this picture for Western scholars, and he may have been hard done by through the publication of criticisms of his work which alleges emotional bias and anti-Western subjectivity. He has, in fact, generously acknowledged much Western work of Sufism, Shiism, comparative religion, and various ways of looking at metaphysics. In, for instance, Sufi Essays, London, George Allen and Unwin, 1972, he covers many interesting points, deplores the activities of superficialists and imitators, discusses the Shia and Sunni attitudes, and cites recent Western work which has attempted to convey Sufi thought in Western modes. <laughs>